Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Proudly Asian. I hope everyone is having a lovely summer. For those of you who follow us on social media, you will know that we were in California for a month again, spending time with friends and family all while we were running Proudly Asian Foods Month, which has been so fun because we've been hearing from a lot of you from around the world telling us about your personal memories with the cuisines and food on items that we feature. It's just been great hearing from you guys about your childhood memories shared with the food that we have been mentioning on our social media accounts. And while we were kind of busy on the social media front, we actually took a break from recording so we could also focus on spending quality time and get some rest in California. It was definitely much needed. And now I'm speaking to you from my desk in Hong Kong, and we have slowly begun picking up season four plans planning and recording. We can't wait to let you know more about what's to come on the show. For this week, because a lot of you have been telling us about how much you like our Proudly Asian food content, we are bringing back a food episode we did last year with the lovely couple behind Oxford-based Tibetan restaurant Yeshi and Julie. What's different about it this time is that we remastered the audio, so the audio quality should be much better than we initially released the episode. And it is such a lovely story because Yeshi and Julie both came from very different places. One from rural Tibet and didn't speak a word of English, and one from England. And their paths eventually crossed in India where they fell in love. And years later, this couple would have a lovely family in Oxford while running their Tibetan restaurant, which has become a local favorite. So I hope you will enjoy this episode as much as we do. Welcome to Proudly Asian, a podcast series that tells bold and proud stories of Asians by Asians. I'm Isabel Wong, a financial journalist who wants to uncover the many Asian stories around us that are waiting to be told. There's never just one way to look at Asians. This podcast will take you through a deep dive into the life stories, struggles and triumphs of young Asians around the world. On today's episode, we have Yeshi Jumper and Julie Kleeman, the English Tibetan husband and wife team who co authored the cookbook Taste to Bed Family Recipes of the Himalayas. Together, they run the Oxford based restaurant Taste to Bed. They talk to us about nomadic Himalayan food culture and practices, mindful living and eating, and the unique flavors of Tibet. Welcome to Proudly Asian, Yeshi and Julie. Thank you so much for making the time for us and joining us from Oxford. How are you doing today? Uh, we're doing great. Doing great. Thank you. Great. And I got to say, when I first learned about your story, it, it was actually through your recent book launch. I saw your book title, which is Taste to Bed and Recipes from the Himalayas. And I was so intrigued because I was like, well, you don't really hear about Tibet every day and let alone Tibetan food. So I was so intrigued by the story, the recipes, and I just couldn't help but reaching out to you to get to know more about your story and let our listeners know about the journey from Tibet, India, and eventually to Oxford. But to start off the conversation, I would like to get into the basics. Tell us about your background, Yeshi and Julie. Who are you? What are you? And where did you grow up? So I'm from Tibet. So I grew up like a very rural place and uh, some enormous uh, family. We couldn't come from more different worlds, really. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she was, was born and brought up in a very rural part of Tibet and spent six months of the year away um, every year, accompanying family members and their livestock up on the high pastures of the Tibetan plateau. And he, he never went to school until he left Tibet at the age of about 19. He walked across the Himalayas to India, and that's where his formal schooling began um, about four years, I think it was, in India. He learned to read and write and some basic maths. And for me, I was born and brought up in London and I was privately educated and went to Cambridge University 
And I studied Chinese there. I, I first visited China in 1992. I was just 17 at the time, and China was still quite a kind of um, wild place to visit, especially for independent travelers. It was the very early days of independent traveling inside China. And I, I really just uh, had an amazing time and completely fell for the place. I always had a love of language, and, and I went on to study Chinese at Cambridge. And eventually, I lived in Beijing for many years. And it was during that time that Yeshi and I met, because um, although my main job at the time was in publishing, I was the chief editor of the Oxford Chinese Dictionary. I also used to sideline in NGO work, and I visited India to to write a rep report for a British government-funded project, uh, in fact, working with people with disabilities in the South Asian region. And at the end of that work visit, I just tacked on a week's break to Dharamsala, which is uh, the Indian Himalayas. And that's where Yeshi was living at the time. So he'd been in India for about 10 years at that point. Wow. And uh, yeah, and he'd been living all over and doing all kinds of things. And it just happened that we were both walking the, stray, the same stretch of, um, of road on that particular day. Yeah, I mean, it's so intriguing how like you were interested in China and somehow you just went to start working. And also like Yeshi's story about walking almost a month from Tibet to India. Those are some really interesting stories. But I would like to get into a little bit about what it was like growing up in Tibet. What are some of the experiences that would bond most people who grew up in Tibet? I don't know. The, um, but there's something I'm so lucky in you know? Well, I was born in a rural place, uh, just so close to the nature, and there's so many animals. Like you know, I talk with my children. I have no, I have children here, so so I have lots of animals. And uh, just winter, it was just uh, we play with the ice. I remember it was just you know, just we have lots of ice outside the winter time, and the summer as well. We can have the summer sometimes, and we have summer snow as well. This beautiful place, and uh, yeah, it's just unbelievable, beautiful place. You, you know what, really? <laughs> and a lot of rivers, uh, we can drink any rivers, everything's clean and uh, not plastic. You know, now I'm thinking like where I grew up, so I'm so lucky. Wow. And I mean, certainly it's a different life to anyone who grew up in a city like myself. I could not imagine um, being surrounded by animals, but in a way it would be a pretty fun experience. But for Julie yourself, when you first visited Tibet, what was your first impression? So the first time I visited Tibet, I was a tourist. In fact, it was the region that I went to anyway. The place I, places I visited felt like the most pristine places I had ever seen. Uh, really kind of amazing lakes with mountain backdrops. And I remember I did like a kind of um, horse tour. And um, I was just so struck with the beauty of the place. Not not initially by the food, but I subsequently understood that I was eating all the wrong things there. <laughs> but I know a lot of interviews you've got asked about your love story. And I mean, I'm sure a lot of people who know about you guys, they have already um, known how you met. But for our listeners who might not be completely familiar with your story yet, would you mind telling us about your love story? So we met by the side of the road, as I mentioned, and we were both actually photographing the same monkeys. So at that time of year in northern India, it actually gets very cold. And these monkeys, they're called Himalayan langurs, and they usually roam the higher reaches of the Himalayas. But during the colder months, they, they have to descend in order to, to find the right food. They're vegetarians, actually. So quite different to those red-bottomed monkeys that you, you're more usually familiar with in India. Um, and yes, she knew these monkeys, which are quite large in size, to be not to be hostile in that way at all. And so he, what I, I remember when we first laid eyes on each other was that he was going in much closer to take his photograph, whereas I had been hanging back. I was a little bit timid. These are kind of quite large beasts. And I remember that I said to him, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we got chatting. And um then we walked up the path together looking for more of these monkeys and eventually taking some tea together. And that evening, um, Yoshi invited me to 
a room that he shared with um, a Tibetan friend and it was just a single room with a kitchen in, in the corner, a very sparse setup. It was two gas rings just fired by this um, single gas cylinder. No kettle, no kind of no frills at all. So I really wasn't expecting much in in the way of um, of any kind of food. But he cooked me up the most amazing hand pulled noodle soup, which on a cold November night was everything I needed in that moment. It was just um, and it really came to define my understanding of of Tibetan food, which comes into its own in in those kind of circumstances when it's cold outside and and you just need something warm in your hands to. Um, to comfort you and provide you mm. with kind of nour- nourishment and fuel. Wow, so it was like a huck for the stomach in the form of noodles. Exactly, exactly. That's such a beautiful story. But of course, um, eventually you guys went from India and now you're in Oxford. You both share two beautiful children. And I just want to know, was language ever a barrier for your marriage? And how did the first meetings uh, go with Yeshi or Julie's parents? Language is still a barrier. <laughs> I think in some ways it's good, I think, just, you know, but just, you know, we understand that in some ways it's much better than a little bit of help than language issue. In some ways it does help. We understand that we have limited language at our disposal, so we have to express ourselves very clearly. You can't hide behind words, mm. which I think um, does happen when when two people share it a high level of one language. So yeah, we have to speak very clearly and that's helped us. As far as really meeting each other's parents goes, I mean, I didn't meet my in-laws until, yes, she and I had already been married many years and, and had two kids. I think they were four and two at the time that we made the first trip back to Tibet. Mm. And so my, my parents met Yeshi before then and, um, well, I, I think as soon as they met him, they were okay. But the prospect of, of Yeshi as my um, you know, future life partner, when it was just a, a notion and before it became a reality in me, I always said to them, you know, when, if they had the opportunity to meet him for themselves, you know, they would be fine and much reassured. And so it came to pass. But before then, I can't say that there was much enthusiasm. Oh, wow. <laughs> about that prospect. <laughs> <laughs> but I know, Yeshi, you eventually moved to England in the year of 2011. Yeah, yeah. So how, how has the, the experience been for you living in England, a place that you didn't know much about before? And were there any good moments and what were the challenges? Uh, challenges, yeah. Um, obviously, I missed uh, where I'm from. It's just very, very different, you know. I just, sometimes I go... Yeah, so but sometimes I go countryside, they see the animals, still I do. But yeah, that's a huge part of me start. And also friend, families, you know, all the behind. So yeah, it's a hard, you know, anybody can leave this different place. It's hard, but in some ways, yeah, it's a beautiful. Just, you know, now I have children, wife, and we settle here. So I'm a happy one side, so. And he's got a dishwasher and a washing machine and the, I think <laughs> it helps. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I think um it's frustrating for, for Yeshi because uh, also, you know, his English is, you know, is is good enough, but um but not necessarily at the level at which he would be able to communicate all the things going on inside his head. And I think that as somebody who comes to the UK with a completely different perspective, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in there. And some of it is really quite surprising. And I think that something that was a a shock to him when he first arrived here, coming to, as far as he was concerned, you know, it developed a very highly developed country was was, um, the level of um, dissatisfaction Mm. and um, kind of um, high rates of um, well, poor mental health. Uh, we we initially had a market store in town for many years, and it was quite an exposed place where um, we would often chat to and feed homeless people and other people who were quite displaced. And I think it was quite a shock to realise that even in a in a place where people apparently the system apparently provides everything, there's still there's still so many so many problems and quite depressing. 
But obviously, the, the, the state of the world has also deteriorated. I'm just stopping. Yeah, <laughs> I must say, I'm very inspired by how you guys, despite the challenges posed by the pandemic, still continued with your charity work. You guys still continue to feed homeless people. So I was very touched by the efforts that you guys were making, even when times were hard for you guys. But、um, we will get into the story and the journey of you guys、um, setting up your restaurant a little bit later in the conversation. But now I would like to zoom in. To the life in Tibet and basically Tibetan culture, and to start off, I just want to know if you guys、um, could tell us about what a day in the life of a Tibetan is like. A、uh, day in the life、uh, depends on which part of kind of part you know. And what time of year?、Uh, one time of the year, <laughs> and it was sort of like you know,、uh, mostly in Tibet,、uh, live in nomad area, just you know, most sort of like on the mountains, lots of animals. And they, they, they obviously need to work hard, but also you know, just I've been in so many different countries, but in Tibet is still you know one of the beautiful country in, in the earth, I think. So yeah, and uh, so uh, some is very very lucky. They just work hard, but also just you know where they live, so just very very nice. There's less concept of time, isn't there?、Mm. It's yeah, the case that that、uh, life is ordered according to what week it is. Or, or month it is, and you know, and there's no such thing as an alarm clock except for for the chickens. Ah, <laughs>、uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's exactly true. And yeah, we have lots of chickens in the morning. There's, there, yeah, it's just screaming in the morning. Otherwise, yeah, just then you know it's time to get up, and you'd have what a bowl of butter tea and some yeah butter tea, sambas, you know, and then so we need to also kind of busy with the animals. So we we need to work with animals, but. Just you know, the, the life is not that pressure. Pressure is、mm. just you know. I suppose that it does depend on on what day you're talking, and there will be times of the year where there probably is quite a lot of pressure to get. There's some houses in Tanzania, a little bit from where from, but it's quite but still, you know, if you finish today and、uh, today, I don't see can work tomorrow.、Mm. Wow. So that's the yeah. That's so nice. In a way, I, I think it just sounds like you basically listen to your body. Let's say, like if you're tired, you rest, and when you have rested enough, then you get up and continue doing what you're supposed to do. As opposed to like people who grew up in the city, like we're always so restricted by time and what we think we should be doing, even though we're tired. So I think, in a way, you know, how to better people live their lives is super close to the concept of wellness and mindfulness to us people in the city. But the next question is. Is, this is rather an abstract question, but I would like to just get your thought in terms of what is the real Tibet, what languages are spoken there, and and what are some of the key festivals and occasions that were observed in Tibet. So yeah, we use Tibetan language. So, but that's quite different end to end. I mean,、yeah. I know that yeah, she says when you arrived in in India and met people from other parts of Tibet, initially it was quite hard to understand them. Because、um, the dialogue is different, you know, very very different. Like in England, like you know, uh, uh, but yeah, like a、uh, Birmingham and the、uh, Manchester, it's a very very different way to understand each other. But it's a Tibetan language. But、and、Tibet is much much bigger than the UK. So yeah, it's a just big country, and also、mm. the where kind of where they live. So that's a separate、uh, aspect each other, and、uh, the language is quite. How to understand each other, but we're same use like same grammar, but this is different、mm. dialogue. I see. And what about、um, any you know the, the biggest festivals that that would be celebrated in Tibet?、Um, what what are some of the key times of the year?、Uh, some we have some of the festivals about in the Tibetan June, probably here,、uh, maybe August. And the summer festival,、mm. and、uh, and then New Year's the key、uh, celebrate in Tibet. So we have the whole stress and and、uh, play arch archery, archery, and、uh, yeah. There's the, even a whole festival、uh, celebrating yogurt. Oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> 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 I mean that that's a summertime festival. I mean, generally speaking, apart from New Year, which is. Uh, Luni Solar, so it usually happens at the same time as Lunar New Year elsewhere in Asia,、um, which is a like like elsewhere in Asia, an opportunity for a lot of feasting, singing, dancing. In the case of Tibetans, 
Uh, but in the summertime, because obviously Tibet is very cold for most of the year, and, and in the summer, people really enjoy, they take picnics out on the grassland and, and make the most of the, the good weather. Uh, when yeah, when they can, <laughs> and uh, it's kind of like a Tibetan summer holiday. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a beautiful tent, and uh, yeah, just you know they'll bring sofas, they'll bring TVs, oh, wow. even don't they now? I mean, uh, yeah. if that's possible, I mean they'll pretty much kind of uh, transplant the living room to inside a beautiful tent out on the grasslands. That sounds so nice. It's like a more advanced way of doing picnic because I just have my basket of food with me. I don't even have a sofa or TV. <laughs> but um, for, for the rest of us, we just hear about the place Tibet. We don't really know much about the culture, the place and the people and the languages are spoken even. So I just want to know what are some of the biggest misconceptions about Tibet or the Tibetan culture? You know, firstly, I think we mentioned that, you know, like in most people's minds, Tibet is a very tidy place. And, and the kind of number one thing is that it's actually huge. I mean, it, it's about the size of, of the whole of Western Europe or, or Alaska and California combined. So we're talking a massive area that isn't necessarily inhabited in all parts because uh, certainly much of northern Tibet is is pretty much uninhabitable. I mean, it's at such high elevation and, and so little grows there that very few people choose choose to settle there or nomads, you know, will spend months some parts of the year there, but but their homes will be will be elsewhere. Most of wild animals. Mm. Churu and uh, or Waryak. Mm. Mm. The Churu is the, is a kind of deer. Yeah. Um who's um Fur is much prized, uh, sadly, for scarves outside of Tibet. Right. Um, so quite a lot of hunting and poaching happens in these wilder areas. So that that's a really big one. And then um, I, a job that we find we have to do most of the time, <laughs> even with customers who've been visiting us under the banner of Taste Tibet for years, is to uh, explain repeatedly that Tibet is not the same as Nepal. So it's quite a, a distinct country with its own um, customs, um, language, traditions, and and like we said, you know, I don't know how many times Nepal would fit into Tibet, but you know, we're so much larger. Yeah, and um, I remember in one of your Instagram posts, you also mentioned some people might think momos um, were actually Nepalese food rather than Tibetan. But then now as a Tibetan, Yeshi, what is it that you want to tell the world about Tibet? What is that one thing that you want them to know? Uh, as Tibetan is really, really important for the whole Asia because all the Jews come from, from Tibet. So without Tibet, whole Asians, all the waters... Where the resources come from Tibet. Mm. So that's the Tibet is really, really important to, to the whole kind of world and the whole region. Because if we not look after the uh environmentally in Tibet and then the whole region has become suffering in the future. So, so again, something that people climate don't, change, yeah. Don't understand. Yeah, they don't understand how important Tibet is because all the big rivers come from Tibet, China, mm. uh Indian, Pakistan, Burma, all the big resources, resources come from Tibet. Wow. So it's, it's an area of out, outstanding natural beauty, but also, you know, considerable importance for the region as a whole. Yeah. So in a way, Tibet is actually crucial in terms of uh, making sure the food security in most of Asia, basically. But um, since we are now talking about food, I would like to focus more on your journey in terms of um, setting up your restaurant and also your, your newly launched cookbook. Now on your restaurant, you know, six months after you started your festival food store, Taste Tibet, which was what Taste Tibet was before it became a restaurant. The Guardian named you as top 10 budget eat in Oxford. The BBC Good Foods magazine also named you in their Oxford top 10 in 2017, among some of the amazing achievements that you guys got along the way. So could you tell us about the journey of starting your own Tibetan food store and restaurant? Was it challenging to get people to try out Tibetan food initially? Do you know, it wasn't actually. Um... I mean, we should backtrack a bit, bit by saying that, you know, quite kind of in true Tibetan style, there wasn't an awful lot of planning that went into all of this. It was, um, you know, kind of 
not here today and then, you know, suddenly out there <laughs> and without a, a long-term plan. And it took us many years to get ourselves a logo or any kind of banner. So it was quite makeshift for a long time. And the menu also kind of grew organically, but it started in quite a safe place with dumplings, momos, the steamed Tibetan dumplings. And I think because that's a food that people were familiar with, even if they'd never tried momos before. Most people love dumplings. Mm. Um, we didn't have uh, any trouble drawing people in. And then when we added curries and stir fries to the menu, again, although they may have had, they have some distinct flavors, the, the concept in of itself was not that alien. And I think also we were quite lucky because we're based in Oxford, which has it's a small city, but a very international city. So we immediately found that we were feeding people from all over the world who were quite open-minded in terms of their food tastes. Yeah, for sure. Dumplings and curry, what's not to like? <laughs> <Surprise>. <laughs> but of course, you also recently launched a new cookbook. Congratulations, by the way. It's called Taste Tibet Family Recipes in the Himalayas. Could you tell us a little bit more about the book? Um, how did it all start? And what was the process of creating the book? I, so, so we have really, really the good customer and the, the customer wants to ask me to write the cookbook. And uh, so the customers push us to write in the cookbook. And we started writing a blog back in 2016. Mm. And in fact, we started um, writing about Tibet and, and the food that we were cooking even before then, when in the very early days of, of Taste Tibet, we used to run a takeaway from our own home. So we had a, a mailing list of people who were mostly local to our our area. And um, every week we send them out an email with the menu. We ask for them to pre-order. And we'd always include a kind of a story or a recipe or some kind of piece of news from Tibet. And those, as she said, those earliest customers really encouraged us to work up these stories. They They wanted to see more. And uh, in the end, as he said, this was really a book for them um, because of their repeated demands for it. But, you know, from our side also, it very much chimed with the, the vision that we have overall, which is to, to bring the name of Tibet to wider audiences um, through food and through our restaurant and our food store. Our capacity is limited. We can only reach the people who you know are physically able to find us. But through the book, we were able to share um, what a lot of our backstory and something of the history and culture of Tibet and these recipes much more widely. So that's really exciting to us that we're able to now have well global reach. The cookbook has, is out not just in the UK but Australia, New Zealand, the US, and and shortly Germany. So. You know that that's amazing to be able to to communicate so so widely. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's a shame that I'm not physically in Oxford to try out your momos, but I, I promise I'll make my way there because I can't <laughs> wait to try out your momos. They just look so good in the photos, and I would like to get my hands on some of those chili oils as well. But uh, <laughs> but in essence, what does it mean to be eating and cooking the Tibetan way? You know, in Tibet, we understand much better from the nature where we live. So we're close to the earth. And uh, like in the cities, like we just a little bit distance where the food is come from. And we don't know how to the, uh, like meat, how organic is it? You know, in Tibet, like everything is organic because we know what is the land and uh, the we treated the animals all the summers on the mountains, not like in a small area. So that's why the hopefully their books, people understand how we eat and where the foods come from so people can learn something. So basically you, you can't take any shortcuts when you, you grow everything yourself and you rear the animals that you ultimately consume. I think what you're saying is you 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 live very close to all of this, and you have you know intimately where where your food has come from. Um, mm. And so, the, in, if you ask about the essence of Tibetan cooking, it's it's always made from scratch. You you know, there's never I don't think I've ever seen a Yeshi ever cook with anything like a pre-prepared sauce, mm. for example. 
uh, or someone else's chili oil. You know, he makes everything from scratch. It's really important to him that he understands exactly what's going into his food. I, and I think that that's, that comes from the way that you learn to cook back in Tibet, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. And in a way, it's kind of like, it makes one to source and also consume the food responsibly. And I also remember reading, you know, one of your blog posts, you also mentioned the Tibetan food culture. It's kind of like a collective experience because no one eats alone. It's kind of like a big meal for a lot of people, you know, coming together to eat, to experience the festivities and food and just basically the happiness together. But the other thing, since you launched a cookbook, I would also like like to get your thought into Asian food representation in the global market. I just want to know what is key in terms of bringing Asian food to a global audience. Did you have to adjust any of your recipes so it might be a bit easier for the Western audiences to adapt? And how does one strike a balance between staying true to the food culture, staying authentic while promoting a cuisine or culture that most people don't know much about? I think when it, when it comes to the cookbook, um, there was a little bit of everything. Um, yeah, she's been in the UK for 11 years now. And so the, the food um, in our cookbook really represents what he's cooking on a daily basis at home and in the restaurant. And so therefore he's using ingredients that are available here and not able to draw on some of those more unique ingredients that we're not able to source here. Yak meat, for example, which is a really important part of the Tibetan diet, um, is simply not possible to get hold of that here. Yak cheese as well, yak butter. So these, these particular things, which would feature very large in the Tibetan diet at home, um, are not a part of our uh, daily Tibetan diet here in the UK, and and so they also don't feature in our cookbook. I think we tried to to get a balance of really traditional recipes. So we couldn't, for example, leave out samban, which is roasted barley flour, the other thing that Tibetan people eat every day, and some nomads just live off samban pretty much for, for some months of the year. This is a very kind of, so barley grows well at high altitude. It's the only grain that really can. And you can enjoy it in all kinds of ways, but um, you roast it and then you ground it to the consistency of flour. And it can then be enjoyed with boiling water as a kind of porridge. Uh, you could even make bread out of it, but most commonly it would be mixed with just enough boiling water and, um, and butter and sometimes cheese to, to form a kind of, um, you know, the, the best way I've come to describe it is, is something that has the consistency of Play-Doh. Mm. So, you know, it's, a, it's a, a snack that you could easily put in, in your pocket in that form. Um, and just, yeah, it's, it's like a snack. And it can be savory or it could be sweet. You could add. Yeah, it's a very flavor, nutty flavor. Ah. And they're very, it's, it's very rich. And then also it's a, we believe that I think for like good for the like in and to bad to like most people like not looking like our weight looking we don't have that and that's good for the diabetes as well it's nutritious yeah and uh, it's just very for healthy it's really I mean generally speaking if you're eating what is locally available you're likely to be eating what is best for you and we all know that in theory but I think the Tibetans are, are quite a kind of living example of that nice anyway so we have samba in our in our recipe book and then we have other dishes in the book that use samba as an ingredient if you're able to to make it or come by it but you know it's usually not essential so the book has um, a, a mix of recipes, really, and um, includes also a chapter of dishes that um, Yeshi himself came up with as a result of the many years that he spent in India. And you'll find if you go to Tibetan restaurants outside of of Tibet, uh, the same kind of the same story wherever you go, because so many most Tibetan people have made their way out of Tibet via India or via Nepal, and and each of them has their own has made their own unique journey and so created their own unique uh, recipes, received different influences along the way. So we've got some very traditional dishes in there. We've got um, the dishes that that we make at home every day that um, 
are definitely Tibetan and maybe sometimes miss a key, an ingredient here or there, but generally speaking, not really. Yeah, the was to, uh, we are obviously young. I learned from my parents. One of my parents are really, very really good cook. And uh, yeah, so the, uh, yeah, lots of dish from my parents. Really. And I think one thing is that if you are, um, you eat very seasonally in Tibet and, or if you're a long way from home and your options are quite limited, you're quite, you, the way that Yeshi grew up learning to cook, you're quite used to just cooking with what is available, what you have to hand. So there's never anything that you you can't do without, mm. you know, and you can always substitute one thing for another. You learn quite quickly what ingredients go well together, what types of ingredients will, will work together. And so we think that readers will be really quite um, surprised and reassured to learn that actually there's a lot of flexibility with these these recipes in the same way. Wow. In a way, like Tibetan cooking sounds a lot like the art that studies the relationship between the landscape and like what's available. But then, I mean, here's a question for you both. Like, Yezhi and Julie, what's your favorite Tibetan dish other than momos? Uh, some Hanuman noodles. And they're really, really, really good. I really love it. You know, the, the noodles are just, you can cook really the better way you can cook. Or if you don't, you can use like kind of pasta. You can make sauce and the way to the noodles are fresh. This is so delicious. And with um, the or, or noodles, everything is made with just plain flour and water. So, you know, also if you're making momos, but you have a bit of dough left over, you can use that to make a little bowl of, of noodle soup. My favorite is the one that Yeshi cooked me that first night we met, which is called mm. Tibetan hand pulled noodles. So you're basically stretching out long pieces of dough and then pinching off the, the end of these pieces and chucking them into a, a bowl of, well, a pot of boiling water with whatever veggies and, if you like it, meat that you have to hand. We, we have a lot of this is called um, tuntu. Okay. We eat tuntu a lot at home. It doesn't have to be winter to enjoy it. <laughs> Amazing. It sounds like comfort food already, even though I haven't tried it yet. <laughs> but since momos is actually one of the signature dishes of Tibetan food, I just want to know, what is the secret of making the best momos? Uh, everything is scratch. Uh, mm. From scratch. And uh, the dough is important. And also feeling as well. So you need both balance. Freshest possible ingredients. Yeah. Uh, so I think just if you cook everything fresh and it just all of it become delicious, you know. Simplicity is key, yeah. as we mentioned. Your um, wrapper is only made with simple flour and water, and then again, whatever ingredients it is that you have to hand, as long as they're fresh, and as long as you can be sure that they'll they'll work well together. You're going to have a nice momo at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, for those who are curious on how to really make the best momos, I recommend you to go check out um, Yeshi and Julie's cookbook. Um, get yourself a copy. It's called Taste Tibet Family Recipes in the Himalayas. And for those who happen to be in Oxford, just go check out the restaurant, Taste Tibet. I can't wait to pay a visit when travel eventually opens up here in Hong Kong. But now it's time for us to move on to the next segment, which is called Rapid Bias. In this segment, I'll be asking my guests biased questions they have got asked at some points in life and also some common biased questions Asians get asked a lot as well. So, Yeshi and Julie, are you ready? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's go. First question. Tibet is basically Nepal. Uh, yes, no. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, we get this a lot. You know, oh, we must, uh, I've brought my friend to taste your delicious Nepalese food. The clue is in the title. The cuisine is actually really distinct from Nepal and the culture and the language and, and everything. There's very little in common between the two places. Because we are fast Arab in Nepal. I have no idea what they say. <laughs> Completely different country. And uh, it's just, I work for hours in the city. It's just, I don't understand what their language yeah, so this is totally different. Obvious to us, but it seems apparently not at all obvious to other people. And next question, Tibet is a very small place. No, fact, we don't have many people live there, mm. but mostly just animals, <laughs> wild animal and domestic animal. All Tibetans are devout Buddhists. Mm, this is interesting. 
I mean, I think all Tibetans are Buddhists, but I would say that the majority of Tibetan people wouldn't be able to tell you exactly what that meant. I mean, Yeshi always said to me that he felt like um, calling himself a Buddhist was a very big claim because he lived for many years inside a monastery complex, so not as a monk, but um, as a kind of lay worker inside a, a monastery complex in India. And when you see close at hand uh, what, it, what it really means to take Buddhism to a high level, you're talking about a lifetime of study. And um, I think so only the monks and only the monks who, who take it that far and nuns are too, of course, um, would, would really be able to, to make that, that claim. Uh, yeah, but you said I'm Buddhist, but I don't know much, you know. You can't say it, and if you don't know much, I'm Buddhist. It does kind of, you know. But I think the one thing that you you could say is true is that there is a Buddhist way of living yeah. and, um, that Tibetan people very much observe, which is others before self. Always look after the people around you before you take care of your own needs. And that's something that Tibetan people themselves may not be able to tell you is a Buddhist concept, but it's certainly a guiding principle in their lives. And the next one is Tibetans don't eat meat. Yeah, a lot of our customers assume that Tibetans would be vegetarian because, again, they're assuming that, that Tibetans are all devout Buddhists. Um, but the reality is that for many Tibetan people, although they might wish to adopt a, t a vegetarian lifestyle, simply don't have that luxury because many parts of, of Tibet are above the tree line. There's, there's very, it's very dry, um, it's very high altitude, and there's very little vegetation that is able to grow. And so nomads in particular live off the meat and dairy of it specifically the yak, but other animals that are able to survive at high elevation as well. So I think things are changing inside of Tibet now that uh, many nomads have been resettled uh, away from these lands in towns and cities, and there is a certain pressure to adopt more vegetarian lifestyle. And you are from Tibet. Namaste. Uh, oh, thank you, Billy. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, said yeah, it's a uh, uh, Indian and the fall they use, but uh, we call and uh, Tibetan calls trahitele. Yeah. We again, we have a lot of people come into our restaurant or to our food stall, and they you know, they may have spent time in in India and make this assumption that namaste is is the uh, the greeting for all, but uh, it's not a word that Yeshi would have known at all until he himself moved to India. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so um, we, if I just want to say a simple hello to a Tibetan, what would be um, the right phrase to use? Oh, trashidli, trashidli. Mm. And it's it's one of those phrases that you can use in lots of different um, circumstances. If someone's raising a glass to you, you would also say trashidli. So it's it, it's cheers, it's hello, it's how are you doing? It's all yeah. those things rolled into one. Wow. So it takes get you quite quite far, further than Namaste. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Thank you so much for playing this round of Rapid Bias, Yeshi and Julie. Now, to wrap up the conversation, I know that except for Taste to Bed, you both have two beautiful children who enjoy making momos and helping out in the kitchen um, from time to time. So how do they feel about their Tibetan heritage? And do they ever wonder about or get questions about their identities? This is so interesting because I think for a, you know, a lot of, I would say, in my experience, the majority of kids born away from the country that you know one parent comes from and which is not possible to visit very often they would often kind of reject that second identity or um or feel uncomfortable about it but in the case of our kids they firmly describe themselves as tibetan they're not english british they are tibetan so they, they clearly feel very strongly that that this is their identity as well and we don't really know where that's come from but we think that's wonderful i mean one thing is we've been able to visit family a couple of times out in tibet so of course that has the context is everything so you know meeting family and and seeing you know observing that way of life was um, was obviously yeah deeply meaningful for them but also we eat the tibetan food in our old town so mm. that's so so and uh, mm. found the food is that the key as well. Yeah, I the think that's also children, different. Children, breeding, uh, 
their favorite things are Tibetan food. Mm, all their favorite dishes are, are Tibetan dishes as well. So, uh, um, when it comes to, you know, I think because they're 10 and 8 now, you know, maybe it will happen more as they get older. But um, we mentioned Oxford is a, a pretty international place. So, you know, in their school, they're not, um, they're not alone in looking different. Um, but, you know, if people do ask them where they're from, they'll say very proudly that they're Tibetan. And by and large, I think that's quite meaningless for everybody else because nobody can put Tibet on the map. They don't know where that is. <laughs> but, you know, I think perhaps that, you know, makes them feel um, special in their difference. Um, it's so, certainly something that they so far are proud of. And we really hope that um, they don't lose that pride in their Tibetan identity as they get older. That's beautiful to know that they are already proudly Tibetans since a young age. And for our audience who are curious to check out your food and cookbook, what would be the best ways to reach you guys, either on social media or like any website? Well, we're really active on social media. Instagram is, is probably the best medium, but we're on Facebook and Twitter as well. And um, yeah, we, we write a blog, which we, we post to those to social media every week. But if you want it in your inbox, join our mailing list. But the, the, the book, you know, for us is the kind of beautiful round up mm. of, um, of who we are and, and what we're doing and, and what we cook. So between all of that, I think hopefully you will in, enjoy um, yeah, there's the enjoy the anybody who's interested by the book can just you know it's a very recipe, it's very easy and very fresh. So it's a delicious and the recipe there I would recommend, you know, it's a special we looking for recipes, that's where they Yeah. Noodles <laughs> they're so delicious. They're, I'm gonna be ordering my copy, seeing how there is no Tibetan restaurants in Hong Kong. So that's my only way um, mm. into trying out Tibetan <laughs> food, which is making my own. <laughs> Brilliant. Now, finally, what does it mean to be proudly Tibetan? Tibet's like a very unique. We kind of understand where we're living, like in a Buddhist way, like a kind of how we to live. If you have some challenge or something that we are kind of easy to adapt to on the challenge. It's a very, very different, you know, the Tibetan people leave the other countries. They're just always very, very easy to adapt. Mm-hmm. And look after each other. Yeah, look after each other, you know. Mm. Whether you're inside Tibet or outside yeah. Tibet. They're everywhere, just, you know, they understand it much better. Mm-hmm. And it's to help each other and uh, that's also we um, I'm doing here as well. If you have some food and that to give to honest people, you know, that's the, my culture from the many generations. So nice. Does that answer it? It's very complicated. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think the world has a lot to learn from, you know, the Tibetan way of living because a lot of it's like kindness, just basically taking care of people around you and animals around you as well. So thank you so much for taking the time to do this conversation with us, Yeshi and Julie. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for thank having us. So much. Pleasure for us too. That's it for this episode of Proudly Asian. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at proudly.asian for more content. We are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and YouTube. Thanks for tuning in. Signing off for now, I'm Isabel Wong.